Hi, this is Lauren Zellin at the World Resources Institute, and I'm speaking with Sheila Patel for the World Resources Report on Sustainable Cities. Sheila, mm. could you please tell me about um, a little bit about your personal history, where you were born, and where you grew up? I'm born and brought up in Mumbai, Bombay as I prefer to still call it, and I've lived there my whole life. And that's where I work now. I studied in I studied in school in Mumbai, and then I went to another town called Baroda, where I studied child psychology. And I came back to Bombay and studied social sciences in an institute there for my postgraduate degree. And then I started work, and I think it taught me to forget everything I had ever learned <laughs> at university. And so what work did you start doing at that point? So since my base degree was in child psychology, I worked at a community center working with children with different social and emotional problems. And many of the kids used to be sent from the juvenile justice system when they were caught either stealing or doing something. And this was in one of the poor neighborhoods in the city. And I did that from 74 to 78. I realized it was a useless job because the children and their family were basically dealing with serious chronic poverty. And all these other things were secondary. So, so all these sort of deep psychology and behavioral modification stuff was, in my opinion, not what they needed. And then that I was given an opportunity to manage the whole community center's activities. And it gave me a break to explore other ways to do things and more by accident than by planning. I basically asked the women who were the main people who used the services of the organization what they wanted to do. And then I was told by everybody it's a damn radical thing to do. <laughs> because they they'd said simple but very sensible things. They, they wanted different hours at which activities were held. Uh, they said they needed help to understand how to manage their lives in the cities, how to get their children to school, what to do with kids that were working because there were no traditional, there was no tradition of creches. In. So before we knew it, we, we sort of turned around the way the system was functioning to make it work for them. And that really upset a lot of the people who were managing the services because they said these women are getting too bold <laughs> <laughs> and they're demanding things and how dare they. And then I made it worse by saying let's form groups and then there were about a thousand women who were regular users and they formed groups and the groups got tougher and tougher on the services and so the the long and short of it was that that transformed me as a person because it showed me that poor women were such tough and courageous women. They were all migrants who had come into this city and they were finding work, whatever they did, wherever they could. And, and everybody was treating them as if they were really stupid or they didn't understand, they didn't know. And it made you realize how much that affected their own sense of self. Because if everybody around you says, oh, you're this migrant, you don't know the language, you don't understand, anyway. But more or equal to this particular situation, we also faced a almost like a weekly or a fortnightly trauma because many of these women lived on pavements off the street you know so they had 
like shack-like structures that were against the wall of a building. And it's illegal. You can't set up your little tents on the sidewalks. And so the municipality would come and brick their houses. And as their relationship with us got better and better, they'd bring all their belongings and bring them to my office and just dump them there so, so that the police wouldn't take that away. And we suddenly realized, me and my colleagues, we suddenly realized that we were like a Band-Aid box. You know, we were, we were trying to get their kids to school. We were trying to make sure everybody was immunized. And then every 15 days, their life was eroded with this eviction. And so, I mean, I'm just sort of, this happened over a period of time, but we took a case to court and we took the, we, we sort of fought a public interest litigation against the city, saying how dare they do this to the poorest people in the country. I mean, these weren't like, you know, they weren't illegal in the sense that they, they didn't, they, every, they, everybody had a right to come into the city to survive. The trustees of my organization were very upset that I took this decision unilaterally. I didn't ask their permission. And they, they didn't, I mean, they basically said that I didn't have the right to do all that and that I had to withdraw the case or do it in my personal capacity and that I was taking too many, um, too many rules in my own hands and restructuring the organization. And so my attitude was, uh, how shall I still do it and get away with it? And then all my friends who used to come to volunteer, they, they said, why are you sticking around here? You know, these people don't really care about the kind of things you want to do. So if you're going to do this all your life, why don't you start your own organization? That's how Spark started. So I resigned in 94 and set up Spark. And many of these friends of mine were the founding trustees. When you founded Spark, what was the premise? What were you trying to achieve? Well, the work that I had done for the six, seven years before, basically told me or intuitively made me realize that the biggest learning that people have is from talking to each other. Poor people learn so much from interacting with each other and they give each other a lot of strength. And women do that particularly. And so we said, how could we create conditions by which we didn't become the traditional social workers or activists, but we became facilitators of such groups mm -hmm. and allowed them to set the priority of what they needed. So instead of us becoming people who designed interventions on the basis of some money that somebody gave us to do something, we said, can we ask women what they need and what they want and look at how we as professionals could help give them those things. So our, our vision was that of a, a true partnership to say, we're a bunch of professionals. We want to dedicate our lives to working on these issues. We don't like the present architecture of how organizations that work with poor people work. We don't know what we want to do, so let's go on a fishing expedition and find it. And everybody thought we were crazy. Nobody was going to give us any <laughs> money. And women were also very upset with us because, you know, uh, this concept of charity trains people to ask for things, specific things. So people would ask, what are you going to give us? No, we've got nothing to give you. But if you tell us what you need, we'll try and find a way to find it. So they'd say, you're really mad people. You don't even know what we want. You don't even know if you can give it to us. 
and yet you're asking us. So we said, try us. So that went on for quite some time. Uh, then we had this uh, judgment that came from the Supreme Court. All these uh, public interest litigations that a lot of other people had put together were then anchored in one particular public interest litigation that went to the Supreme Court. So uh, July of 1985, that's about eight months since we had started Spark. This order came from the Supreme Court, which basically said it was like 20 pages of deep pain and sadness about the difficulty that poor people face when they come into the city and how terrible it is to have to bathe in front of the road and have your children walking around, all that. Mm -hmm. Sorry about all these things. but. The city's business is to maintain law and order and health and hygiene in the city. And so the right of the many superseded the right of the few. And so it gave the municipality the right to evict them with notice on the 1st of November. And so all the women and their families came to us and said, now we know what we want you to do. You want you to stop this eviction. <laughs> we didn't know how to stop it. So we had lots of meetings with, uh, with the other community, you know, people who work in NGOs, who work in communities. We had lots of meetings with the women's groups. And we started hearing two different things. The network of NGOs that were working with poor people in the city or enlightened people who wanted to support this had invited some of the leaders from the pavement neighborhoods who were all men. Many of them were young men. And their collective strategy was that some professionals and some community people should go on every single pavement that was threatened and have a street fight with the, with the police. And they had all these plans of how they'd do it. At that time, when you're very young, that sounds terrific. Even I was ready to do that. But then when I came back, my colleagues and I came back and we started talking to the community women, they were very clear. They said, you're not going to fight. You well-to-do people, you will go back to your homes. The police will come and pick up all the men in our communities. And we will have to go and pay bribes or pay something to get them out. And the fact of the matter is we are not in a position to fight. So you go and find out what we can do to be able to stay on. They said, you're an educated person. Go and speak to the commissioner. Go and speak to the government. And since we said we listen to them and listen to what they have to say, I actually went to meet the commissioner. I had to sit outside his room for four days before I was allowed in. And he basically said, now I have a right to clear the street, so I'm going to do that. So I said, do you know how many streets you have to clear? Do you know how many people? Do you understand the law and order situation you're going to create? Do you know how to handle that? He says, yes, I know everything. So it was clear that they didn't have like a blueprint or they didn't have a, a good strategy, thank God. But it was also very clear that they had this image that these were all people who had just come for a few days and they would, you know, and they, it, was, it would be easy to just disperse them. Then we went to the state government. This was the municipal corporation, we went to the state government. We talked to the state government. The state government people said, what are you people doing here trying to help these people? Help them go back to their villages. So what do you mean? He says, you know, life in this city, 
It's so undignified. They live on the pavements. They wash themselves there. They have no place to shit. Go back to the village. I said, do you know about their lives in the village? Most of them don't have a piece of land. There are too many people. Some of them don't have food to eat. And he says, no, no, no. Villages are good. And of course, young, rude people, I said, why did you come into the city? He says, have you come to ask me for help or to be rude to me? <laughs> anyway, the long and short was that it was very clear that the city had a very distorted image of who these people were. So we went to different uh, institutions, research institutions and other to universities and said, can you help us do a survey of people who live on the pavement so that we could actually present this data to the city? And they also said the same thing. They said, oh, these people are here today, gone tomorrow, don't bother. And so we made this mad decision to say, we'll do the survey ourselves. And I'm telling you this story in detail because it has a very deep uh, linkage to who we are today. So we got hold of some volunteers. We didn't have much money at that time. So we sat with communities and we said, OK, we are not researchers, so what questions shall we ask? And out of that conversation came out some very interesting insights. The women said, don't ask too many questions. Keep it simple. And Try and stick to questions that help explain who we are, where we come from, why are we in the city, what do we do here, and what did we leave behind. So we had a questionnaire, which was the front and back side of our A3. Remember, there were no computers that time. So we had to do this on, we had to go and borrow typewriters that had those big carriages. <laughs> and then we had to cyclo style them. Anyway, we did all that. We printed them. We got hold of people who could give us money to, or do it free for us. We did the survey. We couldn't do all the pavement dwellers, but we did those who were going to be on the main, or what we call the arterial roads. And we did the ward of the district that had the maximum uh, pavement slums, which is where we had our office. And so by the 1st of October, we had a report called We the Invisible, in which we had surveyed, we had done a census of about 6,500 households. And we had a press conference, first time we had a press conference. And we had this book. It's on our website now. And we basically presented this to the press. And the press couldn't believe that we had done a census. It didn't believe that we had actually collected the data. And we basically said, you can pick any street any household and go and do a cross check. And they said, only 6,500 households, this looks much more. I said, yeah, because there are little houses on the street. But there aren't rows and rows of houses. So you have a different imagery. Anyway, the long and short of it is we got a lot of publicity. We went and just plastered these everywhere. I went to Delhi. I spoke to the government. So we went to this very, very senior economist. And I just banged and barged into his room and said, I have this data. What can I do? He basically told me that we don't recognize a category called pavement dwellers. We don't mm -hmm. recognize a call this thing. Then they don't enter our subsidy system. And if they don't enter our subsidy system, they're basically invisible. I said, that's what we're saying, that they're invisible. Mm -hmm. Yet, the most spectacular thing that our report found out was that they came from the 100 poorest districts in the country. Most of them, almost 
80 percent had no asset that they had left behind and that most of them had eaten three meals a day for the first time after coming into the city. So we said these are the real victims of your development policy. So if they come into the city to feed themselves three times a day, then they are the people who should have the first right. He was deeply touched and he says, my door is always open, come and talk to me. I really don't know how we can do this, but let's see. And he helped give a lot of confidence to us that it was okay for all of us to be irreverent and go to different places and knock on people's doors and make a noise. And so the long and short of this is that there was no massive eviction that time. We can't take the full credit for it, but we benefited from it in the sense that the communities began to see the value of this work we had done together. And so come November, they basically came back to us and said, look, we know now what we want. We want a home. We don't want our grandchildren to have their babies on a pavement house. So you do whatever you have to do. <laughs> whatever we were. I was a child psychologist. Somebody was a nutritionist. Somebody was a doctor. One was a biochemist. Nobody had any knowledge or expertise about this subject. Mm. So we said, look, we don't know. But if we all don't know, we can do a quest of trying to find out what we need to know to get this. So we're not pretending that we have a solution. We don't know. But we'll find out. But you have to work with us to find out. I'm not going to go on my own and find things and tell you. You have to do it together. This happened in November of 1985. Around March of 96, Jokin came to meet us. Now, Jokin is a slum dweller. He came from Bangalore many years as a street child to Bombay, lived with his larger kinship group. And then in 1970s, around that time, the settlement in which he was living, which was called Janta Colony, was facing evictions. And then he and a network of young people like him similarly did a big survey of their settlement, mm -hmm. negotiated with government and municipality. And to cut a long story short, they got land for being relocated, which is called Chita Camp today. Now, this has got nothing to do. We were doing this separately. So he and his colleagues then formed an organization called the National Slum Dwellers Federation, which got people from different cities fighting evictions to network with each other. They didn't have too much money, but they would sort of jump on trains or buses and go and support and help. So they apparently had been observing us and what we were doing. And, they, and so Jokin came to me and said, we want to work with you. So we said, OK. What does that mean? So he said, we hate NGOs that tell us what to do. We are very angry with organizations that come with pre-prepared projects, regardless of what we want to do. So we said, oh, we are not like that. Yeah, OK. But then we said, what does that mean? So. We said that we had just formed from all these collectives a women's network called Mahila Milan, which in Hindi means women together. And we said, if we come, we come, we come together. So your organization is a men's organization. So how does this link to all of us? So Jokin said something which was very interesting at that time. Because that was the time when all over the world, 
women were saying that we want 30 percent, but you know, nobody was asking for 50 percent, but he said at least 30 percent representation. So we were part of 30 percent. Jokin said, no, I'm not going to promise any percentage, but we as NSTF, we know that we are only good at agitations and we never take things further than that because we haven't involved women in this process. Mm -hmm. So we already know that that's our failure. So we will treat Mahila Milan as our sister organization. We will share whatever we know and whatever we have learned with them. And over a period of time, in all the communities in which we work, we will assist the women there to form these collectives. So we said, okay. And that's when in 86, 87, this alliance began. So out of the alliance, what emerged was that Spark was the legal face of this alliance. Uh, we were registered, we had bank accounts, we, we knew how to write proposals, reports. Uh, it was easier for us to meet governments or whoever. And we agreed that we would never do anything without doing it together. And in that time, NSTF, which was the most experienced of the three organizations, walked Mahila Milan and those of us in Spark through a very interesting exercise of understanding the ch politics of land, uh, the challenges of designing houses that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that poor people also had a right to design their own homes, how they would do it, how to produce and collect data that would be useful for that and how to create uh, these, uh, these processes through which entire communities understood the challenge of what we were doing. And on hindsight, I think what, what that taught us was that no amount of smart managerial strategy building would ever get poor people land, that it was a deeply political process. And that that process required large numbers of poor people to want these things so that that political process with a small p would pressurize politicians and government to consider this and that however smart we thought we were as professionals and whatever cases we took to court or whatever land analysis we did and said this land is meant for this purpose why are you giving it to this one and that one that was all superficial icing on a deep political cake mm. in which power and power relationships decided who got to use what land and what resources to what end. And an even greater realization for us was that if we as professionals uh, imparted this training to the other groups, we actually produced students who, were, who believed they were going to sit for an exam and if they passed the exam, they would get a house versus what the federations did, which was to give them the political analysis of this. As a result of which, all these communities didn't say, when are we going to get our house? But they didn't expect me to produce it out of my pocket. They knew that it was a joint struggle that we had to do. So, so that produced the tool in our toolbox, which we call enumerations, which is if you're in doubt, you count. You count the houses, you count the people, you count the structures, you count the neighborhood facilities. And you learn to aggregate it and disaggregate it to serve your purpose. 
The other thing which we started at that time was that women's collective started savings groups. And the savings groups generally sound so innocuous, you know. But basically it was women, this is again Jokin's genius. He says every evening after you've gone shopping, you have a little change in your pocket. You take that out and put it together. And you learn to account for it. And over a period of time, you learn to lend it to each other. It served a very important function that a woman who didn't have money that evening could borrow money to buy food. Or if they had an emergency, they could borrow it. They didn't charge interest to each other. And they gave everybody a right to decide when they wanted to return it. But if you look at this at, with a meta lens, what it did was it produced trust because you don't even give 10 cents of your money to somebody if you don't trust them. Women learned to account for it, so they learned to develop a transparency and accountability to each other. And they became bankers because they learned to give loans to each other. So, you know, today banks talk about uh, financial literacy and things like that, and they they, they use all these sophisticated mechanisms to teach them. But I think we taught, we taught ourselves much more deeply and much more powerfully this process. And then this initial group of women started teaching the next group and the next group. So the women's savings book became like their membership card to this network. And so before we knew it, NSTF, which was earlier working in eight cities, started working in 16 cities. And before we knew it, now we're in about 80 cities in India. And gradually through this process came out lots of interesting ideas that people thought they could do. And Looking at the power of this process, we started getting money to allow communities to explore whatever it is they wanted. So a whole bunch of the pavement dwellers said, we want to design our own house. So they designed the house. And we said, OK, there are four prototypes that have come out. We said, let's have an exhibition and let people vote for what they wanted. So they built houses. and now. This was magical because their homes were like, it was between 35 square feet to 80 square feet if they were lucky. And the height of their house was always the height of whatever the lean to was. It was eight feet, it was eight feet in the front, six feet like that. So the standard minimum house size in that time was 150 square feet. So how does somebody who lives in 35 square feet understand what is 150 square feet? If you just tell them, everybody says, no, it's too small. So we actually built life-size houses. We put furniture in, food cooked in, places to sleep, things like that. And then one particular house, one particular community, because there were two, three generations of people had increased their height to 14 feet with a mezzanine so that there were different locations to sleep in. Anyway, that was the house that was pulled. And then they invited the government, and they invited everybody. We got lots of uh, publicity. That was the first time I went for, my, for a television interview. All it did was it brought to attention of the city that these weren't useless wastrels. These were hardworking people. And between four or five people working together, they earned like one or two minimum wages. So they were really in a bad state, and they were working very hard and stuff. Anyway, so, so it created a culture in which we tested out our ideas. And then we had what in Hindi we call a mela. That's like a, 
like a fair, uh, like an exhibition. And then you invited government officials, community people, professionals. And then everybody looked at this thing and said, now do we like it, do we not like it? Government would say, no, this doesn't fit our standards. And then we challenge them and say, the standards are stupid. And then we get some professionals to come and say, no, this is structurally good, whatever. So it gave us our third tool, which is called precedent setting. And then we also found out that whenever any one group did something special or different, helping other groups to meet them through what we call peer exchanges was very was much more powerful than me going and telling them, you know, that group did this and this group did that. So that was the next thing that we did, fourth. And the fifth thing was a new style of negotiation. So you don't go like a supplicant to a bureaucrat's office and say, please help us get houses. No, we'd have a big meeting and then we'd invite the politicians or the bureaucrats to say, there's so many of us, we need a place to stay or we need something, whatever. Consider possibilities of doing this. So we want toilets, we want water, whatever. And gradually that changed both the way government looked at these people and the way these communities looked at them. So, but it wasn't all euphoric and nice and everything because it took another 10 years before the policy to uh, include pavement dwellers amongst the slum population. And it took another five years for the first group of 300 households to get a plot of land. So it was 20 years. But in 1988, we met Samsuk. And she said, we want to set up an Asian network. So we became part of that. And it, it did two things. It, it connected us to people who were doing similar things in other countries and we learned a lot from each other. And because NSTF and Maila Milan were so strong, they began to influence the communities in other cities to do savings, to design houses, to, to network, to federate. So this whole thing of federating became a much used word. And out of that comes how we describe all these things that we do as a federation model. And it's very different from the more conventional way of organizing. So if you went to a school of social work or you went as an activist, the father of all these things was a guy called Alinsky from New York. Mm -hmm. And he basically encouraged activists to go into poor neighborhoods and to get them to go and hold the state accountable for giving them the welfare that they were due to or give them services that they were due to. And his work was taken up by many Jesuits around the world. And it really forms for many years and even today, a lot of people don't know about him, but it's where an external person goes into the community and organizes them for a project or an activity. And then when that activity is accomplished, then they move on and go somewhere else. What we found out is that the things that very poor people need in the Global South don't come out of one cycle of activism. That poor people need to be together for a very long time and that it's only when they have this huge critical mass that they get the attention enough with the state and the politicians to actually negotiate for a solution that works for them. And in this process, what NSTF taught us is that actually the government doesn't know what to do for poor people. So it's the responsibility of poor people to participate in the design of the solutions. So we don't want to just be the basket cases and consumers and beneficiaries. We want to be active participants in designing and executing the solution. 
and so the exchanges that we did in India now extended to countries in Asia and we began to look at ourselves as a much larger community than just being in India. And then in 1992, we from India and Samsuk and others from the different Asian countries were invited to South Africa to meet the people from the townships there. I don't know what the situation is here in the US, but all of us uh, had very, very strong emotive and deep commitment to fighting the apartheid situation. We celebrated Mandela's birthday and there was a lot of excitement of meeting people from the townships and to believe that there can actually be a situation in which we can all help them explore new ways of transforming their lives. We agreed to work with the South Africans to help form those federations. And between 92 and 96, in, right in front of our eyes, the Zimbabweans came, they said, we like this. The Namibians came, they said they like it. And so in Southern Africa, this grew. And then there were some groups in Latin America who said, we are already federations, we like it. There were federations in other parts of Asia, in Nepal, in Philippines, in Thailand. And so we all got together and formed STI. That was in formally in 96. And so gradually the process sort of just grew and grew until it's now in about, we keep forgetting how many, we think it's 33 countries. But essentially, the uniqueness of STI is that these federations are the primary members of this transnational network and we as NGOs accompany them, which is different from most global organizations in which the NGOs are the members and the communities come with them. And so in the last two decades, we're trying very hard to create a governance structure and a representation that internally creates conditions by which the representatives of all these federations become the drivers of this process, not the professionals. But the professionals are there to support and mediate wherever it's needed. And that in all external processes, we actually have community representatives be the voice that represents the urban poor. And gradually over time, we attempt to find ways by which we can work with different sets of people, be they ministers, mayors, bilateral, multilateral agencies, professional you know, research and other organizations to look at ways by which we can articulate our representation more succinctly, more effectively, and that we are seen as, uh, as, an, as an interventionist that produces important added value to what development wants to do in cities. So we're not just, we're not there because it's politically, you know, in many situations, women or you know, you bring all these kind of minorities to make it politically correct. And we say we don't want to be part of the political correctness. We want to come with our own unique resources that can transform the way development occurs. So that's the SDI story. Incredible story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so based on these decades of experience, what trends do you see in housing and shelter and informal settlements and poverty and security? I think we're in a very tough place right now because despite everything that we think we have done as SDI and as other movements have done that, all development is essentially top down. And so poor people continue to be 
beneficiaries and consumers of solutions that are designed by somebody far away or their own governments and there are three kinds of tragedies in that. One is that the, that the product doesn't come to you, it gets siphoned off or it doesn't happen. The second thing is that even if you get the house, it is not accompanied with all the other things that are needed for your survival as a poor person. And the third thing is, it is snatched away from you by market forces that create conditions that in desperation it becomes the only thing that you as a poor person can sell. And then within all these things is the crisis of cities themselves because the laws that, uh, that produce the present architecture of cities are 18th and 19th century laws. And even in the last, you know, last century, 50, 60, 70 years of migration into the city has just produced huge pools of informality that nobody knows what to do. Informality of habitat, informality of livelihoods, they are deeply interconnected with the formal city, but they still remain invisible. And all solutions are to formalize them. Without understanding the implications in the short run and in the long run. So we are faced with a situation where we don't have the politics that we need to produce inclusive governance in the cities where you live. You have countries in the north and south who still believe that poor people are better off in rural areas. And you have a global development industry that's got it all wrong in terms of how to deal with poverty in cities. So if this is the case today, all the other questions you're going to ask me have their answers already that if we do more of the same, we're going to need 500 years to solve this like you all did in the north. You don't have that time. And the volume of people who are going to come into our cities are much more than ever before. And then we have all this challenge of uh, the climate, we have challenges of deep inequity already. So given the present style of intervention, it seems almost unsurmountable. But you talk to poor people, they don't feel like that. They feel something will happen. They can make a difference. There's more optimism there than I have, I think. So with the city, the population of cities expected to double and as many as 50% as of Indian cities still to be built. How do we build a new, more inclusive city under a new development model? What is that model? I don't know what the model is, but I truly believe that unless there is a, a serious attempt for all the people, all the representative groups in the city to transform the way they look at their own cities. Nothing is going to change. So if you look at us, conventionally we used to hit the real estate business, we used to hit the banks, we used to hit the government. Mm -hmm. What do you realize? If you don't develop schemes, you know, systems, if you don't develop your own confidence and capacity to actually reach out to them and say, you can't pretend that the poor don't live in this city. So how are you going to work with us to change that? And whether they have the courage to explore that, whether we have 
politicians who have the foresight to arbitrate these relationships and a governance structure that accommodates all this is really the challenge regardless of which agenda you call it if you bring it to the city it's got to be all these crazy strange bedfellows working together mm -hmm. to find a solution and it's going to be messy it's not going to happen quickly but unless it's attempted i don't think we're going to change the status quo do you think focusing on providing access to services to uh, e equally and especially to the underserved um, is a successful intervention that can lead to more economic prosperity and, and greener cities and productivity? I don't think that they're going to be like these clean silver bullets that are going to come out of this. Although when you write a report, it's very pithy and nice to say so. But I think that's a starting point. Everybody needs water. Everybody needs to defecate. In cities, this is required in volumes that individuals, households, and neighborhoods can't provide. So it has to be a citywide process. And we already know that if you can't get it officially, you lie, cheat, and steal and get it. So if you acknowledge that and you say, OK, let's make it available to everybody. Let us acknowledge that it is a precious valuable and scarce resource. So how should we collectively conserve it, reuse it, recycle it, whatever. So it's going to be a combination of collective agreements that balance the need, the technology, the access, that's going to produce these radical new solutions. It's not going to be just a fiat saying, yeah, we want to give everybody water. There's all these ingredients that are there. And the reality is that 90% of cities all over the world are water scarce. That's the most interesting thing. Most households in third world countries don't have electricity. Most poor people use wood for cooking. So how are we going to put all this together and say different, different strategies, explore this, work on it, and do it at a scale that we've never thought of doing before? What do you think are the keys to making progress with city leaders, with government officials, to actually create this change? I think they all have to talk to each other. I mean, I don't know how many politicians have actually gone and spoken to communities about what they want. We don't know how many administrators or planners or architects actually know what the poor need. So usually it's like a watered down version of what you would do in the formal city. So if you look at the technology, you look at education, you look at materials, they all have to be radically rethought to. And I don't think any one group, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that slum dwellers alone are going to find a solution to their problems. And I don't believe in this sort of self-sufficiency to take care of your little thing. I mean, that's, that's what, that's why the city is such an exciting arena, because everybody is interdependent. So how do you make that interdependency celebrated and uh, produce more communication? And, and now we have so many new tools, many of which we don't know about even, or we don't know the full extent of how to use it. And I think the, the final thing for me is really how young people are going to take this forward. In, most of our countries, two-thirds of the population is below 30. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't know how much, how much they can participate or 
how responsible we are going to make them for all the rubbish we leave for them. <laughs> but I think, I think we, we haven't understood how to, how to involve them, how to transform their vision of things. Because it is a global world and they are picking up consumerism very fast. But that's not going to support the transformation of their lives. So how to change that, I don't know. Mm. But I think all of us are beginning to develop new insights into what we don't know. And I think that's as important as knowing what you know. So sometimes we all behave like we have, you know, you just sort of put some, you know, like a puzzle up together, like a Rubik's Cube, and then say, ah, all the colors are in the right place. But I don't think it's going to be like that. So data was obviously a really important part of your early success and yeah. throughout. Um, how will data continue to play a role in the changing face of development? So over the years, the way we've used data, the way we've politicized and contested the data that poor people collect about themselves versus the way everybody else collects data about themselves has produced slow but and gradual acknowledgement that, that data has several uses. We still face a situation where everybody wants to appropriate it. Mm -hmm. So it's very funny. When, I, when we collect data, they say, oh, but all data should be public. You should give it to us. I say, what about the data you have? Oh, no, that's ours. Poor people can never get hold of recent census data, for instance. But big institutions can purchase that from the census office. I can't get access, or the communities can't get access to satellite images. But you can buy that anywhere mm. else if you have the money. So those inequities are still there. But I think that technology is, by and large, democratizing some elements, while other elements get even further out of reach. So it's. It's not all, technology is not all that democratic as it's said to be. And lastly, um, giving women a voice has seemed to be a central part of your organization. How has that made a difference and how will it continue to? I think for us, the, what women bring into this process is more than just uh, a sort of a political representation success. Uh, we think that uh, that just pushing women to be more responsible, to put more burdens on them, is what development has been doing. Give women loans because they're good at repaying. Educate a woman so that when she's educated, the household is educated. Uh, teach women about contraception, you know, bung everything on women. Don't hold the rest of society accountable for what it does to them. So for us, the, the, the real excitement is to give women a, a sort of collective power to explore those solutions themselves. And it's slow, and it takes a long time, but then we believe that has staying power. And we truly believe that if we actually link the issues of habitat and informality, women bear the maximum burden of that. So we believe they have a right to participate in the transformation of their lives and to have a right to say what they want, to also have the self-confidence to say, these elements of what transformation we want, we can contribute, but there are many things we can't, and we want that from you. And so we feel that's a, that's a different spin on what the development world is doing today with girls and women. You know, they're just burdening women with the responsibility of transforming everything. You know, the girl child this, the girl child that. Nobody is looking at everything around that young woman or that young girl or that 
aged woman who is responsible for changing everything. So you celebrate that, but you don't do anything. You don't do anything about the violence that women face. You don't do anything about the lack of education, the lack of empowerment or representation. But you keep saying, put the face of the girl child in front. So we feel those are the kind of deep-seated changes we want to see. And we want to see women anchoring those processes themselves. And even we as educated professional women shouldn't substitute that. And the beauty of the whole federation process is that everybody there believes that you don't have to change or you don't have to learn new tricks to talk to people who are at the global level. You know, when we first started rep being represented, people say, oh, you guys are really, you know, you must talk like this and you have to have these sound bites and you must have an elevator speech. And all these kind of things as if there's another language in which you speak on the global stage. And what the community leader said to us, development transformation is about our lives. We don't have to change the language. The world needs to learn how to talk to us. So these are all things that we all learn from from communities and in many ways they hold us also accountable to what choices we make. So if I come today to WRI and I am exploring what we can do together, I have to be able to represent it to them and get their acceptance. It's not just based on me because I chair the board of STI. I'm also held accountable that I don't agree to something that they don't want, they don't like. The people on the stage are the federation leaders chosen by communities, not, not a, we, we are there only if we're needed there to support that process. So we like that. <laughs>